pleasant morning to all of you a warm welcome to zoom webinar on diagnosis and management of menstrual disorders what can we do in opd setup and gp practice organized by gmoa and society for health research and innovation kindly mute your microphone and turn off the camera during the sessions and use the chat box to clear your doubts it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker dr rohan silva consultant obstetrician and gynecologist currently attached to the north colombo teaching hospital pragama over to you sir hello good morning good morning everybody so first and foremost i would like to thank uh, gmoa for inviting me for this lecture right so the time allocated for me uh, from 9:30 to 11 but uh, i don't think that i will do such a long lecture uh, so usually my lectures are very small right uh uh but i think uh it will be very useful for you uh, when you practice as a general practitioner or doctor at opd so mainly when i was getting ready for this uh, lecture i really wanted to avoid you know complicated you know jargons right complicated uh, medical things you know just i want to have a you know to teach you uh, how to you know approach a patient who comes to you who present at your gp practice so opd setup with a menstrual disorder i just want to give you an overview so how do you think about the diagnosis and management and what is your responsibility to care the patient so so thinking about your approach not my approach thinking about your approach i you know made this lecture so so this lecture may be very simple lecture but anyway try to concentrate on that it will be useful for you right so i'm starting uh, moving my slide presentation so why this topic is important and how common this problem is you know as a doctors who do general practice who practice as a opd setup you know so you know uh, this menstrual problem menstrual disorders are very common at your gp setup right especially you know uh, 5% of female present at your opd setting i have in menstrual disorders and at the same time this menstrual disorder has a major impact on women's quality of life in turn the impact on the society impact on the country so therefore it's very important you know topic to be discussed now we'll approach this question in this way you know think there is a woman uh, at your gp practice or opd setting so now this patient is in front of you and she complains of a menstrual problem so what is a menstrual problem she's talking about some uh, irregular vaginal bleeding right spotting heavy bleeding whatever she tells something about abnormal bleeding down below so how do you approach so i think first and foremost you decide whether this lady who is menopause coming with bleeding or not menopause that's my first classification right so is this lady who menopause who reach menopause coming with bleeding again or she has not reached menopause so how do you come to that definition so uh, when i search i found the who has defined menopause as this menopause is permanent cessation of menstruation which is caused by loss of ovarian follicular activity and it's a retrospective diagnosis so how do you diagnose menopause right basically clinically you know after 12 months of last menstrual period 
right if a woman not getting menses right you know uh, after 12 months right so once you confirm with you know symptoms as well as you can do a blood test call follicular stimulating hormone right so then you know she's menopause right so the lady who comes to your gp practice or opd setup she may be 45 48 or 50 or 55 and you take the history right have you had stop your menses so the woman is telling yes doctor i have you know stop my menses at the age of 52 now again i have started bleeding right so then it is called post menopausal bleeding right so what are the causes of post menopausal bleeding so majority of post menopausal bleeding are benign right so atrophic endometrium vaginal atrophy those are the commonest causes of you know post menopausal bleeding but unfortunately there are cancers such as endometrial cancer uh, cervical cancer right so there are cancerous lesions also right so therefore when you come across a patient when you diagnose a post menopausal bleeding you should not take it as a you know easy thing i think you know better to make a referral right because so i mean you don't have to tell the, the patient so the, there is a possibility of high chance of cancer but you can tell there are so many causes but we need to exclude the cancer so therefore right uh, better to you know give a referral so we need to investigate further right so now that part is you know sorted right now patient who is not menopause irregular bleeding not menopause right so the next thing so you know you have a patient who is not menopause right she has not reached menopause maybe 30 maybe 35 or 40 maybe 48 right so she comes to you again telling you know erratic bleeding you know spotting right heavy bleeding you know different types of symptoms regarding bleeding so the next step you need to exclude pregnancy is my patient is pregnant or not pregnant okay so it's simple at your setup so you may do a urine pregnancy test if there is a doubt so you can repeat a serum beta hcg test you know whether she's pregnant or not if she's pregnant but what do you call we call it early pregnancy bleeding right so so what are the causes of early pregnancy bleeding so there are some you know dangerous high risk causes such as ectopic pregnancy molar pregnancy and different type of miscarriages right i think if the pregnancy is positive so she needs a scan she needs a further evaluation we have to exclude ectopic pregnancy i hope it's better to do an urgent referral if pregnancy is positive right so going back so if patient is not pregnant right so we call that category abnormal uterine bleeding i hope now i have reached to the beginning of my lecture today what i am going to talk about is abnormal uterine bleeding so i think this practical approach when a woman comes whether she is menopause or not if she is menopause post menopausal bleeding so if she is not menopause whether she is pregnant or not if she is not pregnant so abnormal uterine bleeding today's topic i think that practical approach is very useful at your setup okay now your patient is in front of you she is not pregnant she is not menopause she is coming with abnormal you know irregular bleeding so history is the most important thing so what are the points i want to highlight in history taking whether her menstrual cycle is regular right whether menses is absent or whether she has regular cycles or whether she has irregular cycles frequency whether she has very infrequent cycles you know she get menses once in 3 months or whether she has normal frequency or very frequent so she get menses in 21 days you know 20 days right what about duration of menses so how many days you know does it last whether the duration of menses is shortened or duration is normal or duration is prolonged then volume 
of the menstrual bleeding, whether it's a light, very minimal bleeding, or normal or heavy, right? So you should never forget to ask about last menstrual period. You should never forget to think about pregnancy, right? So it's simple, simple menstrual history is very useful, very useful for you, right? So let me define what is normal menstrual cycle, right? So according to the latest classification, 24 to 30 day, day cycles are, we label it as, you know, normal menstrual cycle. If a woman is getting a flow of three to seven days, it is normal. So if the blood loss is about 20 to 80 ml of blood loss per menstruation, per menstrual period, it is considered as a normal. Basically, normal menstruation is an external manifestation of normal menstrual cycle is the presence of regular vaginal bleeding. Right, so going back to the final MBBS, you know, or going back to your medical student days, right? So as for physiology, physiology we learn hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, right? Just I add this slide to, you know, recall your memories and, you know, hypothalamus secretes GnRH. GnRH stimulate pituitary gland. Pituitary gland secrete FSH and LH. They're responsible to stimulate the ovaries to produce estrogen and progesterone. So this hormonal axis result in menstrual cycle. In female menstrual cycle, you know, it is divided into two phases, follicular phase and luteal phase. So first phase we call follicular phase. Why it is called follicular phase? Follicular stimulating hormone is predominating in the first half of the cycle, first 14 days, right? So during that period, the follicular stimulating hormone produce follicles and follicles are developing, the developing follicles produce estrogen. Estrogen causes proliferation of the endometrium. So therefore, first half of the menstrual cycle, we call either follicular phase or proliferative phase. In the middle of the menstrual cycle, in a normal menstruating, you know, regular woman, they release the ovary, which is called ovulation. So ovulation is happening in the middle of the cycle. After ovulation, the next half of the cycle begins. We call it is luteal phase because the corpus luteum is the dominant structure which produces progesterone and progesterone causes secretory changes. So therefore, the second half of the cycle we call luteal phase or secretory phase. So moving forward. So what you see in the screen is a menstrual cycle of a female. So we label the first day of menses as the day one of the menses. It's very important for you guys, you know, so how to label the menstrual cycle. First day is the first day of menstrual cycle. So in a normal regular menstrual cycle, 14th day is the ovulation happening, right? So this slide, I just want to tell you, patient with symptoms present at your GP practice, these symptoms might be a sign of no organic disease, benign disease, or serious disease. So therefore, don't take it easy, right? You may be busy. Your practice may be, you know, light up 100 patients, but the patients in front of you who is telling menstrual disorder right, doctor, I'm having some menstrual problem, right, continuous bleeding for 30 days, 20 days, maybe having a serious disease. If you miss it, you miss it, right? Therefore, you are the primary care doctor. Don't think menstrual disorders, you know, common, nothing much benign, no. So there is a possibility of serious disease. Therefore, menstrual history, and my approach, menopause or not menopause, pregnant or not pregnant, is very important. 
So this slide will tell you how to categorize in a busy GP setup. While you are seeing about 100 patients, a woman comes with menstrual bleeding. If she's postmenopausal, very high risk. Moderate risk, premenopausal, but either age 40 years old or younger, but with specific risk factors. Low risk is premenopausal, age under 40 years and without any specific risk factors. Example, so you may see a girl who is 16 years with you know, irregular menstruation, right? So it's very unlikely she's going to have a, you know, serious disease. So she may be having no organic disease, just an ovulation, right? So in 2010, Menstrual Disorder Committee of FIGO, International Federation of Gynecologists, Obstetrician and Gynecologists, develop a special classification. So we uh, labeled that classification as farm coin classification. Why this was produced long time before. So when we were medical students, what we were using is the old classification. So you might have heard about menorrhagia, epimenorrhea, polymenorrhea, oligomenorrhea, all the Greek terms. And as they have found it was really confusing. So what they have done, they introduce a newer system. In new system, we don't talk much about this menorrhagia, epimenorrhea, polymenorrhea, oligomenorrhea. We don't talk this, we don't, you know, label these terms nowadays. Now we usually, you know, stick to this classification. This is called, you know, palm coin classification, which is introduced in 2010. It is the classification for my topic, which is called abnormal uterine bleeding. So this is the classification. So when we talk about palm, polyps, adenomyosis, lyomyomata, malignancy and hyperplasia, those are five structural and histological conditions. Palm, coin is for coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic and not yet classified, non-structural causes. So it is very simple. If you know the palm coin classification, it's very straightforward at your practice, right? So woman who is not menopause, a woman who is not pregnant, having abnormal uterine bleeding should be having one of these causes. That's all you have to think about. So, I mean, it's worth write down this list of causes and keep aside in your practice and think about it. When a woman comes, is she menopause? Is she, having, is she pregnant? Not menopause, not pregnant. So she may be having one of these problems, right? So that should be your approach. Palm and coin and easy to remember. Right. So let me discuss, you know, in this palm coin classification, few more presentation, you know, which are very common at your practice. Sometimes you may come across, you know, patients who are having heavy flow. So they tell, you know, they have been continuous bleeding for months and months and very heavy menstrual bleeding, right? So uh, NICE has defined, so heavy menstrual bleeding is excessive uterine bleeding, right? So where she bleeds more than 80 ml of blood and the menstruation lasts more than seven days, which interferes woman's physical, social, emotional, and material quality of life, which is occurring over several consecutive cycles, usually ovulatory. So these are heavy menstrual bleeding, right? So thinking about causes, it's very similar to palm coin classification, right? So it can be due to fibroids, adenomyosis, polyps, coagulation disorders, you know, pelvic inflammatory disease, thyroid disease, drugs, you know, copper IUCD and endometrial cancer. So basically you don't have to think about, you know, this etiological factors separately, as long as you know the palm coin classification, you know, so that is good enough. So what are the investigation you can do? What are the investigation I can do as a consultant? Right, full blood count, you can easily do it. So you can think about 
anemia, this woman is suffering. So check the hemoglobin. So if you suspect coagulation problems, so coagulation screening, you know, you can request, right? Transabdominal, transvaginal scan. So you can refer to, you know, radiologist or gynecologist and get a scan done, right? So high vaginal swab. I don't know practically whether you do it in the private sector, you know, in the private clinic or OPD setup, right? So, but it's a very simple test what you can do. So endometrial biopsy is done in the hospital or some specialists. Hysteroscopy is done by specialists. Thyroid functions you can do if you, if you think this woman is having, you know, thyroid problem, right? So transabdominal scan, so, right? Transvaginal scans. So these scans will detect so many things, right? So what do you know about fibroids? Fibroids are a benign condition. So where the muscles of the uterus, you know, grow and become, you know, masses in the uterus. So these masses in the uterus can be located at different sites. It can be, you know, serosal, subserosal, intramural, submucosal, pedunculated, and different types and different shapes and different sizes of fibroids. Usually fibroids comes in multiple. When having fibroids, they cause multiple fibroids. It's a benign condition, right? So fibroids are one of the commonest causes of heavy menstrual bleeding, right? So basically 30% of heavy menstrual bleeding is caused by fibroid. So therefore, a woman in reproductive age, not menopause, not pregnant, coming with abnormal uterine bleeding. And she described her symptoms as heavy menstrual bleeding. Every month she get menses, but it's very heavy, right? So you think about fibroid, what can you do? You can request for a scan. Scan will detect whether she's having fibroids, right? So if she's having fibroids, so, I mean, medical management of, you know, mephenomic acid, tranexamic acid can be initiated at your GV practice and she can be referred to, you know, further specific management. So another condition I want to highlight, it is adenomyosis, right? In palm clothing classification, letter A is for adenomyosis, right? So what do you mean by adenomyosis? So the normal uterus, and adenomatic uterus. What you see the difference? So endometriotic tissues are present in the myometrium. So endometriotic cells are present in the myometrium. Each and every time when the endometrium bleed during menses, so this bleeder comes into the myometrium. So the myometrium become enlarged, thickened, and it causes heavy menstrual bleeding and severe pain. So how do you diagnose adenomyosis? So actually adenomyosis diagnosis is basically clinical, but ultrasound scan, it shows enlarged thickness of the, you know, anterior, posterior walls of the uterus. In this scan shows the uh, posterior wall, posterior wall is very thick. So that is, you know, adenomyosis and further MRI can be done, but it's not necessary. It's clinical diagnosis with clinical symptoms with ultrasound scan is good enough to diagnose adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is a benign condition, right? So where you can try with some medical management to reduce the bleeding tendency, the bleeding uh, volume and duration. But, you know, if not responding, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we'll move to the surgical management right so polyps in your palm coin classification let a p stand for polyps right so this polyps can be endometrial polyps it can be cervical polyps so these are endometrial polyps one two three and this is a cervical polyp right so what does polyp do in in related to endometrium, menstruation, right? Now, this polyp can cause heavy menstrual bleeding because it increases the, you know, uh, increases the surface area. 
surface area of the endometrium, right? So, and this polyp, this polyp uh, can cause intermenstrual bleeding, right? So, and this polyp, cervical polyp, can cause postcoital bleeding. So, this can cause postcoital bleeding, so intermenstrual bleeding and heavy menstrual bleeding, right? So, in addition to you know uh, heavy menstrual bleeding and postcoital bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding, also uh, important salient symptom, right? So, how do you diagnose polyps? Well, it's easy to diagnose polyps by an transvaginal ultrasound scan. So, in, in endometrial polyp, when you do the transvaginal ultrasound scan, the inside you know endometrial thickness is increased, and cervical polyp can be easily diagnosed by your simple speculum examination of the vagina, right? So once you diagnose polyps, right? So we have to perform polypectomy. So the polyps are, most of the polyps are benign, very rarely. So polyps are cancerous, right? So what are the management options we can initiate at GP setup, right? So mephenemic acid, Tranexamic acid, so you can start, right? So it causes less bleeding, right? Progestogens, right? Noethisterone, right? You can start. I know, so most of the doctors are, you know, prescribing progestogens, right? Combined oral contraceptive pills, also useful, right? So basically, my general advice is, you know, you can start these drugs, but think about the cause. So what our doctors, you know, forget is, so they give drugs, they don't think about what is the reason for this menstrual bleeding. So if you think palm coin classification, this can be a polyp, this can be a fibroid, this can be adenomyosis, this can be a coagulation problem. You think about a cause and then you start this. So what is the importance is, so this, Drugs will temporarily stop the menstruation. But when you think about the cause, you investigate. At the end of the day, you find the reason. So then the specific management can be done. Just giving no it is around for three to five days is not enough. So at least, so you can start no it is around for a good 21 days or 30 days until you sort out the cause, right? So if I come across a patient with menstrual bleeding, I always think about so what are the causes and how do I investigate? So this woman can't have, you know, continuous bleeding until I sort out the cause, then I may I may uh, need to start the noetisterone course and I'll continue it for 21 to 30 days. In before I before the drug stops, I try to come to a conclusion, this menstrual bleeding, menstrual abnormalities due to this. Right. Sometimes you come across, you know, uh, patients who are having little flow or scanty bleeding, right? Compared to heavy menstrual bleeding, we, we discuss in the previous slides, right? So what are the causes? Think about causes. Immature hypothalamic pituitary ovaries, polycystic ovarian syndrome, hyperandrogenism and hormonal contraceptives. So at your GP practice out of these three, so the commonest thing is this, right? You come across ladies like this who are having hirsutism. So you come across uh, patients like this having acanthosis, nigricans, right? So what do you suspect? You suspect polycystic ovarian syndrome, right? So how do you diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome? So there is a criteria for that, right? So when two out of three is positive, so you diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome, right? It is nice to remember these three criteria. So what is the first criteria? So clinical or biochemical evidence of androgen excess, right? So after exclusion of related disorders, right? 
clinically, if you see hirsutism, that's the fulfilling of one criteria. So otherwise, you can do a blood test that is testosterone level. If free testosterone level is more than 1.3 or total testosterone level more than one microgram, so then it is called biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism. And patient comes to you and tell you oligomenorrhea. That means, doctor, I'm getting very infrequent cycles. That's the other criteria. And the to identify the third criteria, you have to refer the patient for a scan. So the scan will detect the ovaries. Scan will detect the small follicles in the ovaries, right? So that is the ultrasound scan appearance of ovaries. So if two out of these three criteria is positive, you diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome. So polycystic ovarian syndrome is very, very common, you know, very, very common. So in some research says about 5% of females are having, some research says about 7 to 8%, right? But anyway, so in our practice, it's so common. So therefore, you know, it's nice to study the polycystic covariance syndrome and initiate the patient education at your level and diagnosis at your level and you know initiate the management for polycystic covariance syndrome at your level it's very important right so when you perform ultrasound scans so the ultrasound scan shows you know tiny little follicles you know in the ovaries which suggestive of polycystic appearance of the ovary right so when a woman is having polycystic appearance of the ovaries, there are two main problems they face in their life. One is infrequent menses, right? They get menses once in three months, four months. Then second one is subfertility. So due to anovulation, they don't have, you know, babies, right? So what can you do at GP's practice? This slide is very important, right? So, and research has proven for polycystic covariant syndrome, right, weight reduction, exercise, diet has a huge impact, right? So if your patient is having high BMI, you must initiate her weight reduction program at your setup, right? So you can introduce her diet plan, an exercise schedule, right? And some targets, right? So what we say, you know, when you start your diet and exercise, minimum you must lose, you know, half a kilo over one week. So therefore, two kilos over one month, right? So like that, you must reach your optimal BMI. So that, of course, you can do. And I have seen some general practitioners are giving clomiphene citrate and letrozole for an ovulation. So I would say, you know, without uh, proper supervision of ovulation, if you can avoid giving clomiphene citrate and letrozole at GP practice is better because sometimes the clomiphene citrate and letrozole, which we give for ovulation, right? Uh, causes uh, ovarian hyperstimulation. So therefore, I mean, ideally, it should be given with supervision, right? So with some, you know, guidance. So therefore, you know, I would say uh, better avoid giving clomiphene citrate, letrozole like ovulation inducing agents at GP practice or PD setup, right? So metformin, you know, is a, is a drug which can be started. So then clomiphene citrate metformin is another option which we use. And inositol is something new coming to the scene, right? So there are some research has proven, some research has not proven. It's a supplement, right? Sometimes we tend to give for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So better avoid that. So why metformin in polycystic ovarian syndrome? When we talk about the mechanism of polycystic ovarian syndrome, right? 
So we have found there's a high insulin resistance develop in the female body in women who are having polycystic ovarian syndrome. Then how do you diagnose that? If you can do a you know fast insulin level, right? Or if you can do a you know insulin level after glucose, right? So there are some cutoff values to detect the insulin resistance. A group of women, some women who are having PCOS, having high insulin resistance. This woman and research has found this woman, you know, using metformin has an effect on their ovulation. So therefore, I mean, this is a good thing, a new thing, you know, metformin has a place to help ovulation in polycystic ovarian syndrome, especially women who are having high insulin resistance. Right. Okay, so coming to the next topic. Sometimes you come across patient at your practice who are having no menses. They are worried they don't have menses. They haven't had menses. When we talk about no menses, which is called amenorrhea, basically there are two categories. One is primary amenorrhea, where this patient or woman or a lady or girl never had menses, never ever had menses. Or maybe secondary, where she was menstruating previously, but not had menses for last six months. Right? So, first and foremost, you must identify whether this is primary or whether this is secondary. So, what is primary? So, when you come to primary amenorrhea, a girl who has never had menses are falling into two categories. One category is a girls who does not show any sexual characteristics. Category number two is girls who show sexual characteristics. So if your patient does not show any secondary sexual characteristics, you must diagnose primary amenorrhea at the age of 14 years, right? When you diagnose primary amenorrhea at the age of 14 years, you must do a referral because we should investigate and find reason why. So basically, you know, investigation is usually recommended at, you know, specialist level, right? So your responsibility to diagnose it and refer. So if your patient or girl, if your uh, uh, girl is brought to you by her mother and telling doctor, my, my daughter, my daughter uh, didn't have menses yet. Right, but when you look at her, when you examine her, you see she's having all secondary sexual characteristics. But how old is she? Still, she is 14 years. What do you say? Don't worry. So she's having secondary sexual characteristics. She has two more years, right? So we'll give her two more years. So come back to me if she does not develop any menses. So after 16 years. So if your patient is having secondary sexual characteristics, you may delay your diagnose till 16 years, right? So at the age of 16 years, if a girl is not having mens, never had menses with no secondary sexual characteristics, then you have to diagnose, you have to label it is a part of primary amenorrhea and she needs expert opinion to find the reason. Secondary amenorrhea, is very common at your practice. So I have given you a huge cause of secondary amenorrhea. Pregnancy is the first thing you think about secondary amenorrhea by doing urine pregnancy test. Breastfeeding is another cause, lactational amenorrhea. Sometimes it is idiopathic. Drugs, hormonal contraceptives, stress, exams, you know, causes secondary amenorrhea. Exercise, weight loss, eating disorders, rarely pituitary tumors, ovarian problems such as PCOS, premature ovarian failure, 
Asherman syndrome. What is Asherman syndrome? In Asherman syndrome, so when we do the DNC, we over cure it, we over scrape the endometrial lining, so which can lead into stopping of menses. Adrenal causes and chronic systemic illnesses and hypothyroidism also can cause secondary amenorrhea. So huge loss, list of causes can cause secondary amenorrhea. Right, so coming to the last bit of my lecture, right, so dysmenorrhea is another menstrual problem, you know, menstrual disorder you may come across at your OPD setup. So dysmenorrhea is painful menstruation. So when we talk about dysmenorrhea, we have two categories. One is primary, two is secondary. So what is primary and what is secondary? Let me describe it and let me explain how clinically important they are. Primary dysmenorrhea is a painful menstruation. A young girl, just after a couple of months, six to 12 months of her menarche, she complained of painful menstruation. So categorized, label as primary dysmenorrhea. So primary dysmenorrhea is not a pathological problem. It is sort of a physiological problem. So, and research has found primary dysmenorrhea is to exceed prostaglandin production in the uterine smooth muscle, which is happening at early ages after menarche, maybe 14, 15, 16 years, right? You ask whether your menses is painful? Yes, menses is painful. It is primary dysmenorrhea. But so if you come across a primary dysmenorrhea patient, right? So if you want, you can perform and you can request an ultrasound scan. You know, most of the time the scan is normal because so it is happening, you know, from the days of, you know, starting ovulation at the age close to, you know, menarche. So what is your treatment? Simple analgesia paracetamol, NSAIDs, right? It's not good enough. And reassurance. So, you know, mothers are much worried about their daughters who are having primary dysmenorrhea. But your reassurance will be good enough for them to understand this is a normal situation. Right. So, topic is secondary dysmenorrhea. What do you mean by secondary dysmenorrhea? Your patient is having painful menstruation, you know, in 20s, 30s, right, or 40s, when you ask, when you check in the history, she tells, doctor, I didn't have such painful menstruation when I was young, when I was schooling. So I attained menarche at the age of 14, 16, 17, 18. I was not having any pain. So this pain is very recent. So maybe two years, five years, now I'm 30 years. So that is called secondary dysmenorrhea. So painful menstruation, late onset. So what we have found, secondary dysmenorrhea is always pathological. So I have made a huge list of you know, causes of secondary dysmenorrhea. Endometriosis, adenomyosis, we simply discussed with hip menstrual bleeding. Intrauterine polyps, you show the diagram of polyps inside. Submucosal fibroid, you saw. Intrauterine contraceptive device, just the loop inside. Pelvic inflammatory disease. Congenital uterine anomalies. Cervical stenosis. Ashamans, uterine retroversion. So, out of this, I'm going to discuss a little bit about endometriosis before I wind up my session. What is endometriosis? It is the presence of functioning endometriotic glands at sites outside the uterine cavity, which induce chronic inflammatory reaction. So endometriotic lining is inside the uterine cavity. But abnormally, 
when this endometriotic tissue, glands and stroma located outside the endometrium, outside the uterus, maybe in the myometrium, maybe in the fallopian tube, maybe in the ovary. So that is called endometriosis. 8 to 10% of women in reproductive years are having endometriosis. So how common? It's very common, right? So this diagram nicely described. So what is endometriosis? This red color lining inside the uterine cavity is located inside the uterine cavity is normal. When this lining is located in the fallopian tube, so when this lining is located outside the fallopian tube, when it's located over the ovary, in the round ligament or outside the uterine cavity, it causes endometriosis. What happens? This endometriotic glands and stroma are hormonal dependent. As I explained previously, your menstrual cycle is governed by HPO axis. So due to changes in FSH, LH, estrogen and progesterone, so towards the end of a menstrual cycle, at the beginning of the next menstrual cycle, menstruation occurs. What do you mean by menstruation? Menstruation is shedding of this red color lining inside the uterus. So it comes outside as a menstrual bleeding. So what happens in endometriosis? If there is a lining located outside the uterus, each and every time during menses, this lining comes out. So there was a little bit of bleeding into the fallopian tube, bleeding into the ovaries, bleeding outside the uterus. Even though the menstrual blood, which comes out to the external loss, vagina outside, this blood is accumulating. So when blood accumulates in the uterosacral ligaments, ovaries, fallopian tubes, rectovaginal symptom, outer surface of the uterus, the lining of the pelvic cavity, bladder, bubble, vagina, cervix, vulva, and abdominal surgical scars. So these sites are the sites of endometriosis, right? So endometriosis clinically present as abdominal pain, pelvic pain, deep dyspareunia, painful defecation, pain on micturition, pain on exercise pelvic tenderness, cervical excitation, tender adenixial masses, tubal damage leading to subfertility, the commonest signs of endometriosis. This is an image. So if you suspect endometriosis, right? So your clinical diagnosis of secondary dysmenorrhea, it's better to request an ultrasound scan. So it will tell you whether this is due to fibroids, polyps or endometriosis. What you see, in the screen is an endometrioma. So this is endometriosis present in the ovaries. So this endometriotic lining will bleed into this mass every month. So collecting blood inside the endometrioma. So this appearance we call ground glass appearance. It's typical of endometrioma appearance. And this scan shows two endometriomas. Basically, just I want to tell you, this lady is having one endometrioma in the right ovary, one endometrioma in the left ovary. Here you see the uterus there and left endometrioma is touching the right endometrioma. We call this kissing sign because two endometriomas, you know, come together closer in posterior to the uterus in the pouch of Douglas and there are a lot of additions. This is called grade four endometriosis. It's very severe, right? So, and coming to the, the final part of my lecture, just I want to educate you about CA125. So it's another test you every day come across. You know, patients who are undergoing CA125, you know, so, due to different packages, different health packages. So, I mean, they don't know what is CA125. Let's just do the CA125. But as a doctor, you must know what is CA125. What is the clinical importance of CA125, right? 
CA125 is a blood test widely used as a marker for epithelial ovarian cancer. But always keep it in mind, right? So CA125 level can be high in benign conditions such as pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, adenomyosis, and fibroids. Therefore, CA125 level high is not always a cancer. So you don't have to, you know, educate patient. This is a cancer. No, you can't say like that, right? Because CA125 is so common. I have seen so many health, you know, insurance packages and things. They include CA125 as a, you know, screening, but it's not, you know, still recognized as a screening for ovarian cancer scientifically. But when you, when we come across a pelvic mass or an ovarian mass, which is a possibility of ovarian cancer, we do CA125 because CA125 level is very important to assess the risk of the ovarian cancer. But at the same time, CA125 level can be high for benign conditions such as pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, the benign condition we just talked about, adenomyosis today, we discussed fibroids, so our benign conditions. At the same time, you know, non-gynecological causes such as gastrointestinal tract tumors, it can cause. So I'm going to tell you a practical, you know, uh, example and wind up the session. This report I come across very recently. So patient, she's 27 years, right? Her CA125 level is 101. So it is high, right? So, and the lab has, you know, marked in red color. It's very high. Yes, it's high, right? But what she's having is secondary dysmenorrhea, okay? So, so ultrasound scan, she is having an endometrioma like that. And when we do the laparoscopy, we see the chocolate cyst. So therefore, say one, two, five level, you come across at your practice, it's not always cancer. So there are a lot of benign conditions which can increase. So um, actually my presentation is over, right? So again, I should be thankful to the GMOA for inviting me as well as thankful to you guys listening to me, right? So. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, doctor is there to coordinate with me, you know, to answer the questions. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, sir, for the excellent presentation. Uh, there are a few queries. First question from Dr. Chaminda. What could be the management of a teenage girl with irregular menstrual bleeding? Right, so teenage girl with irregular menstrual bleeding. It is, uh, can you answer this call, my dear? Till that, I'll call her back in a few minutes. Right, so basically, you know, my approach, teenage girl, is she menopause? Not menopause, right? Teenage girl, right? Can she become pregnant? Yes, she can become pregnant. So why don't you do BTHC, urine HCG, right? So if she's pregnant, think about ectopic, miscarriage, molar pregnancy, early pregnancy bleeding, teenage girl, she's not pregnant. Okay, fine. So then what are the causes? Think about abnormal uterine bleeding classification, palm coin, right? So, but teenagers, so this underlying pathology, serious conditions are very rare, right? But anyway, as she's having, you know, irregular bleeding, you must investigate, right? Irregular menses. She needs a scan. She needs a full blood count. She needs thyroid assessment, right? So she needs, if necessary, other hormonal assessment, right? So then you decide what is your management. You find everything is normal. Right, so then irregular menses of this teenage woman girl 
may be due to an ovulation, right? So maybe due to PCOS, maybe your weight reduction, very useful. Sometimes you may have to advise, you know, three cycles of combined contraceptive pills, hormones for her to get her menses normal. So all this use the approach, you know, the flow chart I have, you know, given in this lecture. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, there's a few more queries. By giving a net, won't it cause regression of the endometrium? So will it affect further endometrial evolution? No. No, uh, no it is not. Basically, most of the men, they bleed due to proliferation of the endometrium. Why endometrium proliferate is due to estrogen effect. So when the endometrium undergo proliferation and bleeding and bleeding due to estrogen, so you need some progesterone to stop the bleeding and to stop the you know, menstrual endometrial shedding. So I agree. So long term, Noethisteron therapy is to atrophy the endometrium. But what I am describing at your practice is not noethisteron for six months, not that. So at least for a two weeks, right? You always give for about three to five days and they start bleeding again. So at least two weeks. And then within that period, you must think about ultrasound scan. You must think about endometrial evaluation by a specialist. You must think about, find the reason why this woman is bleeding, right? So if you think in that way, right? So I think, you know, your treatment will be very useful at your GP practice. Because what I'm always telling, think about the cause, not the symptom. You know, symptom is there, but think about the cause, symptom and cause, both you have to tackle. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. One more question. Can PID present as foul smelling discharge immediately before or after menstruation? What should be the treatment? Yeah. Basically, when we talk about PID, PID in our setup is not very common. But when we talk about, you know, uh, uh, clinical setup in Europe, you know, or the Western countries, PID is very common, right? So foul smelly discharge, vaginal discharge is more suggestive of pelvic inflammatory disease. But, so what I am telling at OPD setup or GP practice, PID is overdiagnosed and antibiotic therapy is overuse, right? So it's misuse, right? So therefore, I mean, if you suspect PID, right? So what you can easily do is if possible, high vaginal swab, and clinically you suspect and treat with antibiotics. Though the best, you know, recommended antibiotics regime is doxycycline and metronidazole. Sometimes we combine with keftriaxone, IM as well. But what you must remember is in, in local setup, pelvic inflammatory disease are not very common. We don't come across much. So as compared to other countries. But when you suspect, when you diagnose, then there is a place for antibiotics. But I strongly suggest not to give antibiotics for each and every abdominal pain comes to you without any vaginal bleeding, suspecting PID. Thank you, sir. One more question. What's the management for middle-aged lady who has completed her family with irregular menstruation for a few months? What investigations needed? Right. So then, again, my approach, right? So middle-aged woman, she's not menopause. She's still menstruating, right? Family completed. That's a different story. Still, she's potential to become pregnant. So whether she's 42 or 45, if she's coming with menstruation irregularity, think about pregnancy first. So you do the pregnancy test. If it is negative, right? So she's not pregnant. Then again, you think about palm coin classification. So these are the causes. 
So what investigations you perform, right? So you can temporarily stop her bleeding with, you know, no ethisterone, right? Progesterone. And then think about uh, arranging a scan and full blood count, right? Speculum examination to exclude any local causes, right? So then manage as it is. Thank you, sir. One more question. Why is Asherman syndrome classified under no flow or dysmenorrhea? Right. So what happens in Asherman syndrome? So when we scrape the endometrial lining, so endometrium has three layers. Stratum basale is the most innermost layer which produce the endometrium, which regenerate the endometrium. When we scrape when we do the over scraping, sometimes we damage the stratum base alley. When the stratum base alley is damaged, so there is no basal layer to regenerate the endometrium. So therefore, after over curating, so after over curating, so they develop dysmenorrhea. So dysmenorrhea, how do they develop dysmenorrhea? Because a lot of additions in between walls, right? And so Asherman syndrome, so it's sometimes, you know, the, the whole endometrium is not damaged. Occasionally, there can be a little bit of bleeding. So due to additions between walls, the cervical internal loss is close. So when the internal loss is close, there sometimes there can be accumulation of, you know, blood inside. So therefore, in Asherman syndrome, the commonest presentation is secondary menorrhea, but rarely it can present as secondary dysmenorrhea as well. Thank you, sir. One more it's kind of a case discussion. A 15-year-old girl with amenorrhea with secondary sexual characteristic was presented with lower abdominal pain for two months on a normal presented with reduction of urinary flow, later found unperforated hymen. How can it happen? Please explain. So, so right. So, so then, then secondary sexual characteristics are present, right? But if the girl described abdominal pain monthly, clinically it is suggestive of, she's menstruating Due to outflow obstruction, the menstrual bleeding does not come out. I taught you to wait till 16 years if patient is asymptomatic, right? So mother brought to you a girl. She's totally asymptomatic. She's not having pains. She doesn't have complaint. Her complaint is no menses, right? But she's having secondary sexual characteristics. You just wait till 16 years. But the case you are describing is 15 years secondary sexual characteristics having severe abdominal pain every month. So can you wait? No, you can't wait. You have to do a transabdominal ultrasound scan. When you do the transabdominal ultrasound scan, you see hematocolpus, you see hematometron that is blood accumulated in the vagina, blood accumulated in the endometrium. So if you just examine her down below, right? So her hymen is bulging like a bluish, you know, uh, bluish color balloon. It's hymen is bulging because accumulation of menstrual bleeding. So all this, you know, you should have a clinical approach to that specific case. So thank you so much for two more queries. What is the best time to do ultrasound scan during menstrual cycle? And in gynae issues, who should do the ultrasound scan, either gynecologist or radiologist? Absolutely fine. Whether it's a gynecologist or radiologist, it's not a big issue, right? So what you have to do is you have to do a proper ultrasound scan. So the best time to do an ultrasound scan. So basically, there are, you know, a fertility device, there are, you know, two things. One is we do uh, follicle tracking around day 11, day 12. So that is to check follicles, right? The day 11 or day 12 of the menstrual cycle. Sometimes we do baseline ultrasound scan on day three, right? But sometimes 
depending on the symptoms, patient complain of pain, severe dysmenorrhea, or something else, you know, irrespective of the menstrual cycle we do, right? For a patient who is not having that symptoms, the best time may be, you know, 11 or 12 days to check whether she's ovulation, right? So, I mean, any, any expert who are, you know, trained and qualified to do an ultrasound scan, you know, it's absolutely fine. Thank you, sir. Uh, last query, what's the best treatment for premenstrual syndrome? And if a young girl is having scanty menstruation, what should be the approach for investigation? Right, so scanty menstruation in younger women, you know, you don't have to worry. So it may be, you know, still the, the HPO axis is not mature. So there's no point in, you know, giving hormones to make her bleed more, right? So the time will sort out the problem, right? Premenstrual syndrome is a very common disease, but not So, when you come to management of premenstrual syndrome, right? So, uh, at your practice or OPD setup, when you diagnose premenstrual syndrome, the first line, the treatment you can initiate is the combined oral contraceptive pill, right? So, and 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 new uh, research has found uh, diastereone containing uh, pills are more effective. So you can initiate, you know, combine a hormonal contraceptive pills as the first line. So there are so many steps, you know, in steps in the ladder, right? So treatment of premenstrual syndrome. Sometimes we give GnRH analogs, you know. So those things, you know, we can initiate at expert level. But premenstrual syndrome is a basically, you know, management initiation at OPD or GP practice. Thank you, sir. There are no more queries. So I would like to thank Dr. Ruan Silva for his excellent and informative presentation on behalf of the GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. Now, um, I would like to uh, present a small token of appreciation to Dr. Ruan Silva. Please accept, sir. Thank you so much.